Greetings, beloved. I am the true vine, my father is the husbandman. John 15, 1, 1. Amazing. The father lights it, the lamb is the light. I'm the vine, and the father is the, the gardener, is, is the wine grower. Wine had been very important in those days because wine is what helps civilizations cope. And it's one of, the, one of the pleasures of life, I think, that always is equal. In other words, wine is always celebrated, always appreciated. I would say wine and oil, like it says in the Bible, uh, because oil is like an elixir of life. Organic, say, uh, uh, parent essential oils like, oh, I don't know, everything from flax oil to olive oil to all kinds of different oils. You can take the oils, for example, you can take olive oil directly by the teaspoonful of organic olive oil and it will uh, correct your cholesterol, fix your blood f pressure, um, take away acid reflux, and prevent you from getting too drunk should you drink too much wine. Yeah. It's interesting, isn't it? I'm not recommending that you do that as a way to deal with a drinking problem. Okay. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he takes away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purges it, purgeth it that it may bring forth more fruit. So every branch that bears fruit, he, you say, why do bad things happen to good people? Well, because when bad things happen, what happens? Character develops. Spiritual strength develops. Or, or you perish. But if you don't perish, it doesn't kill you. You develop spiritual strength. And that strength and that insight that you get from adversity is the pruning so that you'll bring forth now due to adversity even more fruit once you get over the heartbreak of betrayal backstabbing and the rest of it uh, you know, games and power trips and all the other stuff people uh, are weakened to do in their compromised genetic state and I know there's a lot of Christians will take umbrage with that statement that humans are compromised genetically and that that was what the garden story was really about. Ah, uh, well, that's what it's about to me. And you know what? As I arrived at the uh, symbology, as I understood it, because it's very subtle to understand. I mean, you know, you can have someone tell it to you. Like, I know, you know, got a couple of friends that constantly are on this topic but they were kind of coming from the serpent seed angle, but they're on this topic. But that's not what convinced me because even they have a little bit different take than what I'm talking about. That did not convince me. What convinces me is the structure of the book of Genesis and it's... Um, and then, and then, you know, the other thing is, I want to, I want to stick with John 15 here. Um, the third verse says, and, I'll, and I'm going to bring that in. Now you are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine. No more can you except you abide in me. You abide in him because he is with the Father. Therefore, you abide with the Father, because you abide with Jesus. I and the Father are one. You are in me, I in the Father, Jesus said in John 17, just two chapters ahead from here, that we are one. I and the Father are one, that you may be with, with us where we are, as one, 
So we, you and me, in Christ, are just one. I know it's kind of hard to accept, but I mean, to me, it means just one person. <laughs> you know, we are Christ, just one person. That means we are the Father gives light, and the Lamb, you and me, is the light thereof. The throne of God is in, the Lamb sits on the throne and reigns forever and ever. Those that abide in him sit on the throne and reign forever and ever. Amen. And I'm story. So a lot of people have likened this um, earth experience, which I have to say is the, um, the only sad thing is that people buy into it as like the only reality because that makes the world a very heavy place when you, when, um, you seek to achieve success here of your own making. And remember, no one can bear fruit of his own. It's only that you abide in the branch, that you're connected so that the nutrients flow to the branches and to the, to the grapes. Otherwise, uh, the grapes are cut off and, and actually pruned and they fall to the ground. Because if they don't abide in the vine, then there's no life. Likewise, people, if they bring forth works that are disconnected from God and seek to glorify them and them alone, um, that would be self-consciously. I'm not talking about doing crossword puzzles or even you know, writing poetry about stuff that's bugging you. I'm, you know, I'm not talking about doing art. You, know, you can always do art and say... For you, Father, I'm talking about creating something with a purposeful ambition to be separate from God, which is what the world is, separate from God. They abide in one another, thus they feed off one another spiritually to get what the Father, through Jesus Christ, gives freely. Um, I'd rather abide in... Jesus, but because the strength, the supernatural strength is undeniable, and the fact that there are so many people that come against uh, anyone that is for real in Christ, uh, that test of them coming against, yet the strength still, the thing still per goes on, where if you weren't in Christ, you would just fall to the ground when the bullies would line up against you and say, join us or die, uh, you would basically... Um, probably die or you'd collapse on the ground or you'd be harassed or you'd be gang stalked and whatever else gang stalking occurs to people that are not them who are not connected to their branch which is the pyramid the pyramid the obelisk the all-seeing eye is their branch that's what gives them life they feed the dragon and the dragon in turn feeds them and that's the bondage they are in they cannot imagine having free, free spirit energy, guidance and whatnot given to them, or defying the rules of physics. In other words, in the Father, there are miraculous things given. Super strength when those times are needed. The ability to rest without having... I know one, one brother that... Basically, he says hey, he sleeps four hours a night and he's completely refreshed and no problem. He's a total 100,000%, you know, in the word and the Lord. I mean, the Lord is his th thing. There's no separation there. He abides in the Lord. And he, uh, he has like a super strength. I've also seen those who are given power by the dragon suddenly have amazing musical gifts. Amazing, you know, they can suddenly do something they couldn't do before because they, 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 they took the, that, that, that power. And uh, 
you know, and it, and it was also given to them. But in being connected, they see that, wow, you can go from zero to rock star over like, or zero to pop star or whatever. You can win American Idol, I mean, if you got this thing going on. So there's that, there's that because the Lord allows that as a deception and a lie. So that people think that's the true thing because they, they, they can measure it because they can touch it and see it. But they don't see the subtle thing, the great strength of Samson, for example, with when a lamb, who is admittedly the target of, of all, including in the spirit, just constantly clouds following, weird things happening. But there's that strength where that brother or sister, that continues despite the entire world and the entire satanic kingdom being on that one person. That, my friends, is true strength beyond and above uh, getting some kind of temporary singing or dancing or account, whatever, whatever your endeavor is, abilities. Because you see, once you've taken from that trough, one must continually take from it because remember... It's the same thing with the world. I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. True vine. Why true vine? Because there's another vine that's the false vine. That's why it says true vine. I think this word true is missed a lot of the times when we read John 15. Certainly I missed it. I am the true vine, as opposed to what? The false vine? The live, there's another vine? Yes, there's another vine. There are two vines. And what the world likes to do is have, the worlders, I should say, what they like to do is they like to have their vines or their two trees and they have them intertwined. You see on their logos? That's the corruption of the double helix DNA. They do it unconsciously. They don't know why they're doing it, but that, that's what it says to me. It's loud and clear. They want to make a bridge between that which is of God and that which is of Satan and bridge them together in a new species. That, 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 we, that puts God in a checkmate situation where he must perform. Because obviously he allows them to go on, right? He allows them to get, you know, to go down to, to the crossroads, meet the devil, and sell their soul to be the best blues player in the world. Remember that movie? I think it was Steve Vai that played the... Uh, the Hot Shot, and it was Ralph Macchio that played the, uh, I think that was a Walter Hill film. Not sure. That guy's still, yeah, that's an, he's an old guy now. He's still, he's still making movies. I don't know if they're any good. I, I, I think he may, if I'm not mistaken, well, I'm not, I'm not really that in on the movie biz anymore, but I will be. I'll be looking into all the, the movements of it, because it's kind of like a, a mission for me to deal with you, right? You in Hollywood, you in, in um, you know, that, that I have to remain hidden behind the gates, because I understand that perfectly, <laughs> and I understand how you're vexed, but not to worry, you know, this is the thing is, is what you're wanting from the lowest pauper to the highest celebrity, what you're wanting is you're wanting freedom. And you realize that this thing with the dragon and this, what it really is, is, the, is a soul being tethered to the pyramid. And I know that's difficult, but then the pyramid represents the entire satanic kingdom of a prison, if you will. But within that is a great technology that's all we see is a surface of it. But we don't understand how it connects portals and, and um, wormholes and, and time space and all it, it, how it connects everything. How it's allowed to have grown to a, to a certain point and how you know, humans are used for the genetic material. It's, it, the whole story is really a story about being enslaved due to the, you know, corruption and needing a way out, a liberation, Messiah. So Messiah takes on more meaning. In other words, Messiah is not just 
the historical Jesus. Messiah is the capital L Lamb. The Lamb is the light of the New Jerusalem. The people are the light of the New Jerusalem. The Lamb, you know, God and the Lamb are one, and the Lamb sits on the throne, the Lamb being God. And the people of the Lamb are connected to the throne forever and ever. Um, how the heck did we get here? That's a, we're a long way from there, right? Okay. Um, and at the same time, you have, you know, the, the, the making of the dualities, the, the double helix DNA, the uh, light and dark, positive and negative energy, the, uh, the 3D universe, time and space, um, and, and um, science and, and the rest of it. You have all of this um, physicality physical world, physical laws and principles um, that point to another higher dimension. A dimension where there would be, for example, no Satan. So when I say higher dimension, we're also equating dimension with heavens, of which there are an infinite number of. We know that there, we, we hear about seven heavens, seven levels of heaven. And that's fine. But within each context, there's seven trillion times seven trillion times seven trillion aspects. In other words, infinity within each one. And paradoxically, those, um, you know, and ultimately they're not separate, obviously, because otherwise there would be a paradox. So we're told, well, I went to the third heaven, says Paul. I can't tell you what I saw there, but I mean, I went there. It was amazing, you know. He was translated for a, a second, uh, and he, he had a couple of translation uh, incidents. But in this one, he was taken in the spirit, but translated really, because it was a literal. It was a literal going there, and he couldn't talk about it because he couldn't, because there's no language that would explain that. It was like a glimpse of that New Jerusalem concept. And there was no language that could explain what that was, is why he didn't talk about it. It's not like, well, I'm forbidden to talk about it. No, no. I mean, I understand that, you know, John is forbidden of talking. Uh, you know, he had to seal up uh, some things in the book of Revelation, but, you know, that, and that also is because uh, it would be, if you knew certain things, you would just sit there doing nothing. Um, the other thing is, even if the mystery was and w revealed to you, you would not be satisfied, you see, because it doesn't feed you in human terms. It may feed your spirit to know. But a lot of people would say, I don't want to progress down this road to that. And it's like, well, guess what? It's not about you. It doesn't really matter what you say. And that's a concept that even Christians have a hard time with. It doesn't matter what you say. It doesn't matter what you say. Christians have a very hard time with it doesn't matter with what you say. It doesn't matter what you say. How do you like that when, when your mother or father, when you're a youngster goes, it doesn't matter what you say, just do it. Look, your opinion of it doesn't matter to me. Just do what I said makes you feel kind of ridiculous, doesn't it? And then later they say, look, you've got to learn to take responsibility. I thought you said it didn't matter. Well, now it's time for you to learn to take responsibility. In other words, you have to take responsibility for your actions that do have consequences, that do matter, but ultimately it's not about you. You want to promote good things in the world and good comforts for others and serve others and... Seek God diligently, and he will guide you to all good things. And as David said in Psalm 37, I've never seen the seed of the righteous go begging for bread. You know, even though the seed may act up, there's kind of like a little extra oomph there from the spirit because of the righteousness of the 
In other words, the righteousness of the fathers is also visited upon the children, just like the sins of the fathers is also visited upon the children. But, and when, when it is, it means you get sent to death row for a murder your father committed. It may not seem fair to you, but that's exactly what happens. Many of you feel cursed. I would urge you to look at your parents or grandparents to see where that curse came from. God has allowed you to work it off. In other words, you're cursed for a certain period of time in your life. And then eventually, you know, if, if you survive, if you overcome, you win. And, and God makes the devil back off. God makes the devil back off. God opens the path clear. God says, I'll protect you. The devil still comes around to test and say, see, when you layer up problems, look. Look how quickly he or she forsakes you, Lord. That Job game is always going on. You always have to be conscious that there's a Job game, that when, when rough stuff happens, that the first instinct of you know, a child would be to turn against the father and say, screw you, you know? Uh, why did you let this happen to me? But don't, don't take the bait. Um, the, the saint that is truly wise would obviously kneel, obviously pray, okay? Very important, kneel and pray. And obviously seek the Lord, especially under those conditions, for safe sailing. And would, you know, never think to blame the Father as, <laughs> as I, no, I, I fell into this, I did it the other day, I just, I was just really tired and fed up and um, kind of snapped, and then I've been repenting ever since. I told him, you know, look, Lord, if you want, I'll just do a little, we're just going to be in the Word every day, as we are today. So maybe it was good in a way. I, I do realize, and I just want to say this to all of you, I do realize that we're, you know, our weakness. I do realize to cut you and me a little slack here from just because I know our weakness. I know how easy it is for someone who's been walking with the Lord for 30, 40 years to suddenly make a stumble and, you know, uh, and uh, attack the maker, you know, or suddenly do something in, in rebellion or just, you know, fall into some stupid thing. Uh, and then, of course, you know, the true saint recovers and repents. The reprobate or the one that wasn't really ever a saint, they, they just keep on a going. And the Lord allows it, allows them to prosper by it. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. And it just keeps doubling down. If a man abide not in me, um, I'm, I'm sorry, if, it's, it's hard to see this because it's a, uh, on, a, on, a, on a laptop. If a man abideth, abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered, right? No nutrients. And men gather them and cast them into the fire and they are burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified, that you bear much fruit, so shall ye be my disciples. That's really simple. It's really complex, too. That takes us down to uh, verse 9, uh, 15, um, verses 1 through 9. Um, and then it goes on, you know. With, with all the things that are repeated by John later on um, in, in, in 1, 2, and 3 John, uh, things like this. Um, if you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, that your joy might be full, echoes of, John, of the chapters to come here. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love hath no man than this. Here's the definition. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends, which is the foreshadowing of um, 
the crucifixion. And also a portent that in a sense we are all crucified in Christ, yet live, but not us, but, the, the, but, but Christ Jesus lives in us, thus we become the Lamb. Who is the lamb? What is the lamb? I think you get it defined here. That's what I love about John. John's writing comes from the angels. You see what I mean? There's just the style and the way it's put together. Just from, from one, the first chapter of John on. The first chapter, the first opening. Let's just do that. Because this is all you need. This is all for today on, on this one. So if we go to... Um, John 1, 1, beginning at verse 1. I mean, we waste no time. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And that also, and it was in this context, um, is, is also present tense and future tense. But, you know, it says was, but don't, but don't get hung up on that. There are people out there that would take that was and they would say, yeah, the word is God and Jesus is the word. But you see, that was the way it was before Jesus came. But then Jesus, the father sent Jesus and then he was the word. So the word is with Jesus now and the father is still the father. So Jesus is not God. And they'll use that was. I mean, I, I know, I know it's. It's horrific that people, look, you can, you, some people can't see the forest for the trees. What, they can't see what the Bible means, what the story's all about. I mean, you can watch that Bible series on TV, and I never did s settle down to watch it. I wanted to record it, but I, it's, I think, available on DVD, and I may watch it. But I may get something completely different than someone else. I'm looking at it as a whole. I'm looking at it as a as something of another dimension. I'm looking at something deeper, in a sense, but, but simpler, more simple. And that's the way John's writing is. It's more simple than, than humans. I'm, I'm saying that John is probably inspired by literally angels causing him to write, to take down the words, as it were. Because the prose, oh, listen to this. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him not anything made, not anything made that was made. I'm sorry. And without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehend it not. Not exactly. I mean, this is so far beyond anything else written in Scripture and in terms of style and prose and, and, and that, it's, that it bears pointing out that some scholars have even said it's as if John was either angelic or angels were telling him what to write. <clears throat> it's very otherworldly. Um, and then it basically in the, in, the, in the first say 20 verses or so it kind of sums up the whole you know it sets up the whole story but the main thing is the, and the word was God the same was in the beginning with God all things were made by him and without him was not anything made that was made in him was life and the life was the light of men and the light shineth in the darkness, and the darkness comprehendeth it not because of the corruption. Hence, therefore, after that paragraph, if you will, there is a need uh, for the two to become one, the wedding of spirit and flesh, for the breach to be healed, for reconciliation with God to occur. God being a spirit and being holy can have no part of sin. You notice when we sin... You know, from the littlest one, from just being a little bit selfish one day. When we sin in that manner, we find ourselves far farther from God. And when we seek to serve others, 
and recognize it's not about us, but, but our creator. When we put that first, we tend to be closer to God and less troubled ourselves, stronger spiritually, more self-oriented things, weaker spiritually. That's why when we do our endeavors, you know, whatever your projects are, whatever your goals are, I think it bears repeating that, you know, there needs to be a constant giving of it over to the Lord. I mean, the Lord wants things made, wants projects done, wants things to come forth, wants, he's doing a work. All of us are like the actors here. We have to be connected to the, uh, if you will, the director, because if we don't have the script, the word, and the director, God, right? God, God's the director, Jesus is the script. So if we don't have a script or a director, what happens? If you're going to be spending millions of dollars shooting a movie, a million, I'm sorry, millions of dollars per week shooting a movie, and, and what happens? Uh, you know, let's just put it this way. Spending about two to five million a day on some of these giant productions. So we can't afford not to have, we need the director and we need the script. And we need the actors to what? To push into the script so they know, so those lines become not just external lines, but they become the characters that are being. You know, life is breathed into them by the writer and the director and the producer and everybody else that's involved. So, so that there would be a creation of a story. This is very much like being a, you know, creating God the creator. Creating a story. That's why it's so interesting when people create a Bible story. Right? It's so, so, so much of a doppelganger. It's like man, life, you know, imitating art, man imitating the creator, which is what the creator wants. I mean, we are cr creative. But if we don't have God, that's why if the director is not respected, the movie will most likely be a, a failure. Just because, and people in their ignorance sometimes, and this happens on big shoots and everything, I mean, no, they won't do it publicly in your face, but they're dissing the director the whole way through and there's all that going on. That kind of discord and division, no matter how mild, that kind of uh, hurts morale and the project isn't as blessed. Hence, a lot of movies fail in Hollywood because uh, they want to be a director. They want to be the writer. I, I haven't met anybody below the line <clears throat> that um, you know, crafts and makeup and hair and you know, uh, set design and, um, you know, electricians and grips and all the rest of the people, lighting technicians and uh, camera tech technicians and all the rest that go into this, these productions, which are amazing that they get done at all. Uh, with all that that's going into it, um, I've never really seen any one of them that in every department there's somebody or a group or sometimes all who have their own dream of making their own film. So that's why they got into filmmaking. So they took a job they could get so they could work in the industry and be closer to it, but their goal is to be a director of, of their own independent film, let's say. And so they're always judging God. <laughs> you see, they're judging the director because it's, I, I would do it this way. Look, he's making a mistake. I can't tell you how often that goes on. In fact, these people are very serious about films. Like if they go out and see a, a film, they're, they're obsessed with the director, the, the people that work on films. And it's true around here. We live on a sort of a movie set area, and uh, they're shooting a lot. Um, and all these people that are working on these films, even as extras, they have dreams of doing their own. And with video technology and everything else, and you can get an avid editing system on your personal computer, on your laptop even, and you can, you can bang it out, you know, if, if you're so inclined. You'll, you'll find that you need um, money and actual actors to really pull it off. So there's the rub. Why should the director be king, be God, when if he didn't have all these very talented people around, he'd, he would look like, you know what? The director is 
made to look good by his writer, by his actors, by the cooperation on the set, by his cameraman. That's what makes the director look good. Choosing the right people, we're all geniuses in their own craft, so that ensures that he's going to be like, worshipped, bowed, I'm not worthy, but to the director. And they get power mad, and then that, that then in turn gets everyone angry on the set. Well, God, is, it's a similar thing. If the actors weren't great, if the set design wasn't great, if the location scouting wasn't tremendous, if, the, uh, if any department wasn't genius, then by that measure, and by genius I mean real, to produce a re the whole point of movie making is to produce something real that the audience would believe is real. They would suspend their disbelief for those two hours in the dark. They would believe in it, so much so they would emotionally bond with the film and have a cathartic result as a result. And we've been telling stories to each other for thousands of years with the exact same goal, whether it's a, an, a single storyteller around a campfire to a vast movie production. It's always been the same thing. Without a story, without a script, without the director or the storyteller, um, you have nothing. So likewise, when people... Uh, are contentious about, say, God's existence. And there's all these laws going in. You can't pray. You can't. There's all this mocking and dissing of God. And hence, because of that, there's so many bad things that happen to the just and unjust alike because God will not be mocked and is no respecter of persons. It's not about you. It's about him. And if uh, things start getting away from the script, well, not that they can, but I mean, we're just we're putting it in human terms. If things start going away from the script, the word, if people start mocking the word, they do. Then there can be no script and the actors have no purpose. Fortunately, the real script is that everyone is doing it, whether you're good or evil. You're fulfilling that script. God has written in both sides of the aisle. He's written in all the parts. So he cannot fail he will, despite everything, and because of everything, get his movie done the way he wants it. But that's, that's the thing. And, when, and what happens to people, you know, just, just trying to torture this metaphor a little more, and I'm sorry, it's probably horrible. But, okay, so let's say people mutiny on a film set. What happens? Oftentimes the film gets shut down before it's completed, Another director is brought in. They're asked to recut. This doesn't sound good, does it? In the end of the day, maybe it goes out. It should have been an A movie. It becomes a B movie or a C movie. Or it goes straight to video. In other words, it fails. When, and, and all because uh, an actor, uh, a group of uh, not craft people, I don't you know, it, somebody or people in their discontent, in their need to play games in their need to bring in sorcery and witchcraft and do power trips, somehow that all went bluey, compromised the project, and as a result, pain. The director not working, the writer not working, the producers not working, the actors never working again, the uh, craftspeople still staying in their lousy jobs if, if they hate them. I mean, there's some people that don't, but usually they, they want that as a step up. So it's misery for everybody. When there is fidelity to the project, there's a blessing. Goes out, usually, not always, but usually does well at the box office and everybody works again, i.e. they are blessed. So I think this metaphor holds when you look at it like that. If we are to stop disrespecting the Lord Jesus Christ or disrespecting those who worship him and pray, as we're doing in our society, even the military now. So I predict that, first of all, the military morale is going to go straight down through the floor and that the U.S. military, the next engagement it's in or engagements will lose every time out. And that people in the military are going to be punished as a result, even if they went in with the best intentions, because the military now is playing God rather than 
being beholden to God. They are now mocking God and becoming God, so that's not good. Whenever anyone does that, including me, when I do that, I can predict you're headed for a fall. If the U.S. military, the NSA, CIA, you know, the whole military industrial complex is now mocking God and banning, they're banning conservative patriotic books that deal with, say, God and country, like something Mark Levin would write or something like that. When they, when they do that, you know, start banning books that are conservative, meaning, you know, connected to, the, and banning prayer, and then allowing, um, say, they overturned a law against sodomy and bestiality. And I don't care what you think. I know one thing, that there's enough problem with, with sailors going, <laughs> going ashore and getting drunk and loose sex, but if it's in the barracks, um, that's another morale thing, you know. Uh, I'll, I'll just leave it there. The idea of bestiality, I don't know why they would want to, to lift a ban on bestiality. Are they intending to... I mean, that, that's a weird one to me. But it seems like whenever there's the, the gay issue, and of course, as I've always said from the beginning, and this is just, you know, you gays have to just really get this through your heads once and for all. This political use of you, using you as a useful idiot to get this agenda through, has nothing to do with you or your rights to cohabitate or have legal whatever. You know, if I had to do it all over again, I wouldn't even bother uh, having gotten married as per a license or the state or anything. To do it over again right now, knowing what I know, I wouldn't have done it. But let's put that aside for now. It's a, it's, it's, there's another agenda here, and of course it's a vast agenda, you know, leading to hybrids and machines and corruption of DNA and use of the military, which has been decided. It's, it's like there's a coup d'etat that has occurred. Okay? And, the coup de, and I've been warning about this, and I told you in 2008 when Obama was elected, it's basically over in terms of free speech. And I said all those things in 2008, and it, it's been borne out to be 100% true. And it's even more massive than that because it's a, uh, the Kings of Terror, the Death Season, uh, MK Ultra, or if you like, Manchurian Candidate, uh, uh, assassins going out, you know, gun control, gun confiscation, uh, no prayer. And there's a reason for that. No prayer. Um, and also liberals are being used. I mean, you know, to get this through. It's got nothing to do with the liberalism that you remember. But no prayer is because prayer to Jesus Christ, or the, 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 they fear prayers to the living God because they know how powerful God is because they're at war with God. That is the U.S. military, the State Department, the administration, you know, the Pentagon, obviously, the uh, agencies. And they're now moving to color it with law that any form of prayer to Jesus will be banned, but not to Allah. And they have said nothing about that. In fact, they're paving the way for Sharia law because they believe that Sharia law, enforced by the U.S. military, uh, through perhaps a, a faux World War III, false flag World War III, nuke a bunch of people, you know, then have everyone kind of worship the state for re restoration and... Um, you know, at that point, it would be, you know, enforced. So when I see feminist women, women who are, you know, breadwinners these days, women who uh, have been told they can do it all, they can raise children and have a, a career, and they don't even need a husband around. I could say a lot about that. I'm not going to get distracted with that right now. But the point is, is that... Uh, they, they would be told by Sharia law, which is being embraced by the liberal administration, which is not liberal. It's authoritarian or totalitarian, which you know, which is what we said in 2008. But the bottom line is that um, women would be subjugated and gays would be assassinated, would be murdered under that regime. 
Sharia law. How many liberals, many of whom are also gay, are embracing Islam? Answer, many. Amazing. To embrace something that would be your own execution. Or for women, would be, you know, if uh, subjugating women to, you know, rape and incest and, and uh, uh, abuse, that, that would be tolerated. And even stoning, if there's even a suspicion that a woman has done something wrong, women being property. How many, let's put a show of hands, how many liberal women are embracing Islam right now, both in Europe and here? with those kind of rules, that women are property and slaves? Answer, many, most. In fact, like-minded liberal women are the first ones in Europe, they're, they're, start, they're running to the burqas, who were liberals, who were, who were statists, who were, um, you know, for... for uh, you know, nationalizing health care and, you know what I mean, all the liberal policies, they are now putting the burqas on and throwing out their feminist ideals and, and, and running to the burqa, to Sharia law. How many will bow down to Sharia law and throw out their feminist principles and everything else? Answer, many. So I just find that to be very ironic and strange. I, I, I just, you know, that that feminism would be wiped off the map because feminism, liberalism, all that's all kind of tied together. It's set aside for Sharia because that's what they want. The, the dangest thing. I mean, you, you just can't figure... You try to figure it out. But I'll, t- I'll, t- I'll give you the answer, the quick answer. It's because, it's because emotionally it feels good to them. See what I mean? That's the only answer you need to know. It feels right. That's how they do everything. It's based on how it feels. Okay. Okay, so I'm going to hit a couple more verses here. Um, and um, okay, well, it goes on, and, and, and I just want to get to this... Uh, to the point. So Nathaniel is brought in. Nathaniel saith unto him, Whence knowest or Nathaniel saith unto him, Whence knowest thou me? Because Jesus saw Nathaniel and said, Behold, an Israelite indeed. In other words, he recognized him as a as a Israelite well, beholden to Yahweh. Jesus answered and said unto him, Before that Philip called thee, when thou wast under the fig tree, I saw thee. Nathaniel answered and saith unto him, Rabbi, thou art the Son of God. The, Thou art the king of Israel. Jesus answered and said unto him, Because I said unto thee, I saw thee under the fig tree, believest thou? Thou shalt see greater things than these. And he saith unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Hereafter you shall see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. That's the end of chapter 1. Hello. How, may, how much... And then there's a whole bunch of stuff that happens that uh, I, I skipped over because I just wanted to focus on the little-known um, section that most people think about John the Baptist uh, baptizing Jesus. But, excuse me, we have this incident of Jesus recognizing Nathaniel because Nathaniel saw him as the son of God, king of Israel, you know, and we understand that he is the Logos, the Word of God, and we understand that that is God. That's the fundamental understanding from the very beginning. Only God could do what Messiah can do. Only God could be a true Messiah. Only God can work, can draw you to himself, and this is the mechanism that he uses, but ultimately we would all admit that it all ends up being one in the end, and that in the end we would all have been actors, playing our various parts, doing our scripted roles. And in the end, every action, in everything we do, in everything we say, 
in every bad reaction and good reaction we make, and whoever we belong to, and whoever, whoever we don't belong to, sound like the Pink Floyd Dark Side of the Moon album, <laughs> and everything, and all that you think, and all that exists is, you know, but, but I'm not going to make the thesis that, uh, but, but, uh, but it's eclipsed by the moon. I'm not going to, but the sun is eclipsed by the moon, which means, but the occult rules the world is the meaning of Dark Side of the Moon. I know you know that. I know we don't have to go back to that, do we? People, oh, dark side of the moon, that's really cool, man. Yeah, I dropped acid, smoked a bunch of weed, and, well, that was really cool, man. I'm like, really? You mean oh, an album about the occult is, uh, and how it has a grip on mankind and how uh, wars and rumors of wars and pain and suffering and, and uh, us and them and all those songs it didn't make any impact on you whatsoever? You just thought it was cool, man? Is that, is that where you're at? I mean, I, I know, I, see, here's the thing. I'm being generous there. I'm being generous. Seriously, I'm being, I mean, I know, I know. I'm kind of a snob that way, you know, when someone doesn't know something. Because it's not, I, you know what, it's a, it's a defense mechanism. I, I do feel bad. And I don't feel above it all. But I just, as a defense mechanism, via my frustration, sometimes I, you know, could appear to be a bit elitist, if you will, in my intellect. And I, and I, uh, I want you to know that that's a um, feigned thing and that's no good and that's, that's, a, that's a sin. And I've done it over the years. You've forgiven me. And I'm still doing it. I'm sorry. To call that person that says, hey, man, I'm just grooving on, you know, smoked a bunch of weed and I'm really into the whole thing and had a light show going, saw Dark Side of the Moon perform live. And boy, because I because that's what was going on back in the 70s, right? In the late 60s, early 70s. And boy, that was really, I mean, what an experience. That's almost as good as going to 2001 in Cinerama. And I dropped acid there, too, man. Cheech and Chong. <laughs> Um, and what was 2001 about, my friend? I don't know, man, but it was really cool. You know, okay, well, it was about um, creation. It was about, uh, if you will, the meddling of DNA or a mystery that was in, in embodied in a symbolic black monolith. It, 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 it dissected, it, 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 it crossed time and space to get to the heart of the matter that, that basically what Kubrick was considering there was that, you know, who, who were our progenitors and, and who created us? And it was, and it was, a, and, and it was an emblematic that the mystery is this black um, monolith that seems to be present at every turn of humanity and every, every seeding, if you will, every evolutionary kind of thing. Evolution is not natural. It's, it's something, I believe, that is engineered somehow, but designed by God, if you will, in the first place, to do whatever it does. But certainly there's adaptation to various... You know, we adapt. Right now we're adapting to GMO foods. That's, that's evolution. That's, that's some form of it. Um, I just think it's amazing to me that uh, see when I went to see 2001 I got very disturbed I saw a man asking the big questions and coming up with uh, paradoxical answers I saw a genius with incredible gifts far beyond the rest of the filmmakers of his day and even today putting his all into something that basically uh, uh, answered a question with a question. The most profound question of all, why us, why this, who, where, and why? Um, and, in that, and in that context, the movie is very disturbing. It's not, wow, man, hey. In that context, the Dark Side of the Moon record is very disturbing. Very disturbing. I found myself very disturbed by it from the, the very first listening. 
It wasn't, wow, that's cool, man. Wow, cool, yeah. Let's get a light show. Let's get that black light going. Not at all. Um, the Dark Side of the Moon frustratingly repeats through one song after another thematically the ironclad rule of the occult upon man and makes a case for making a place for yourself in the world. In other words, dealing with it, accepting it, going with it, and then railing against them, i.e. the warmongers or the evil people out there, whatever, recognizing that they're, no matter what you choose, um, there is an there us and them battle. And so in the end, no matter what you aspire to, no matter what you say, what you do, everything is pre-configured because the sun is eclipsed by the moon. That is what they were, and I would say grappling with, because I don't think they really answered any questions. I think they posed questions and they posed different little scenarios and they layered it up with some uh, amazing engineering and producing and music uh, for the purpose of asking a question and posing another question as the answer to the question of why. Why existence? And <clears throat> given that there is existence, what must we do to exist? And the answer is, you must make your deal with the powers that be here. Look around, choose your own ground is the lyric. That's the, the, uh, um, the evidence for that. Choose your own ground. Use your free will to choose your spot, i.e., you know, join. But then there's an us and them, and the war just keeps going on back and forth, and who knows? People are just getting killed, and no one can stop it. So then from, from that point, choose, look around, choose your own ground. Um, you, 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 the, the, the dark side of the moon is also about a race, about how you missed the starting gun. The race, you know, 10 years hence, and now you're just getting to know this. When basically kids already are, are being, you know, in certain families brought into it early. You're just now getting on with it. You missed the starting gun. They're 10 years ahead of you. It's a race. You got to start early to win. That's what Dark Side of the Moon is about. Hence, it really, really, really disturbed me. Now, let me go even further. The Bible calls the life here a race, the race to overcome, the exact opposite of the Dark Side of the Moon. The Dark Side of the Moon says, yes, the starting gun started, and you're just now understanding that they're all running, and they've been running for 10 years. They're the ones, here's what it's saying, they're the ones that are going to be the honchos and the, and the rulers because they got started 10 years earlier than you. Presuming you're someone in their 20s that sort of missed out on your high school initiation or whatever. And, uh, and, and so they'll say, hey, you've missed 10 years now. But the, the real answer to, to Pink Floyd, and this is what they didn't know, is the real answer is 20 years. Yes. Sorry, guys. The real answer is 20 years because the movers and shakers and honchos begin when they're three. I think Led Zeppelin acknowledged that. When they're three. Yeah, they get started when they're three. I, 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 I'm a witness. When they're three. And what does started mean? Well, of course, they're not going to tell you. But it deals with the global pedophile network. And uh, that's, that's the, uh, the one part of it you know when you're three. And then, of course, it's a global murder network. You know how things happen and it never gets solved. That uh, mafia there. And, um, you know, sign up with that and better your odds. Choose your own ground. And in the end, though, hello, hello it's not your own ground because the sun's eclipsed by the moon. Therefore, choose your own ground, sucker. It's not yours. Hello? So the conundrum is posed at the end of the album, which I think is... Good, they kind of did what, what Stanley Kubrick did. It was a you know, genius piece, and what they did is they, they simply answered the question with a question you know, that, that, that uh, 
you know, that even though you've chosen your own ground and you're making your own way through here by conforming to the, to, to the, the, the death camp parade or whatever, well, death camp parade is actually not about that. That's, uh, that's another thing. But I mean, by, by conforming to the way of death, um, you are basically going to find out that it's not smooth sailing ahead because the sun's eclipsed by the moon. There's always further and further knowledge. There's always somebody else who's got it going on more than you. There's always, you know, a hierarchical ladder of, of you know, well, you better bow down to your superiors and you better know who your superiors are and who your inferiors are because you have to bow down and then and, then, and or rule over them. And if you don't take up the task of the race, which all that that I just described is part of the race, these guys get started when they're... Uh, you know, they they um, they all think it's fun and games when they uh, when they join. They go, oh yeah, wow, well, high fives all around, and they don't realize, sucker, you're dead. You're a dead man now. You're basically on the way to being a hybrid, a robot, uh, a holographic um, lie. Uh, you know, perishing. Uh, there's a way that seems right to a man, but that's the way of death. Now I'm preaching at you right now. I'm I'm only doing this because look if. If the plane's going to crash to the mountain and you have a parachute, I'm just saying get the parachute on and jump out of the plane and live. That's all I'm saying. I'm not judging what anybody does. I mean, I, I fully understand. You were just doing what you thought the right thing was. And then you found out it was really the wrong thing. But now you're too deep into it. To, it's too spooky. So it's, you're just going to fret and wring your hands as, as yet another one who lives a life of quiet desperation, not knowing what to do. And meanwhile, you're seeing the incredible totalitarian, the totalitarian takeover of the United States. No matter what the voters say, no matter what the people, even the liberals are now jumping on the bandwagon, uh, screaming and yelling, and Obama's doubling down on his meanness, his mean-spirited uh, attack on the United States. And they're finding out he's not a liberal. He's not one of them. Of course he isn't. He betrayed them. He's not a liberal. He's not a conservative. He's not a liberal. He's a revolutionary. He intends to overthrow the United States and, he's, and the people who helped him do it are going to be thrown under the bus and he's already proven he's done that. So, I mean, that's what's going on. This thing is being, the word is conquering. It's being conquered. And um, there's a lot of brave souls standing up to it. I, it's my wish that, that both liberals and conservatives for their own survival would stand up against it and join, and join together and stop bickering about stupid stuff and get, get busy trying to save the Constitution, but it may be too late. That's not my purview, though, right now. That's not my focus. Other people talk all day long about politics, and the one thing I know about politics is that um, it's a you know, lousy mistress. I see people get upset, and my, you know, like my, I see Trish, she's really an activist, you know, but she, I see her in tears over what people do. And I'm like, yeah, they can be really cruel. They can, they can murder children. They can, they can, you know, uh, they can throw people in death camps and starve them to death and then machine gun them or put them in gas chambers. They can, you know, people do those things. You know, given, you know, when they're in a mob mentality, they, they, they can do anything figuring it's justified. They get caught up in the mob. They get caught up in it and they, then they regret it later. And, um, when that happens, uh, God says, you know, the rule is, well, then when man goes to the occult, and you know, the, the Nazi regime was the occult, the Obama regime, I would, I would contend, is the occult. Basically, that's the God. It's not Islam. That's just a means to get there. But it's the pyramid, the all-seeing eye that's ruling, the, the, if you will, the obelisk that is just glaringly outside the uh, Oval Office window. It's right there. That's the God. And that's the way. And, and they don't care if you don't agree. They're, they're going to show you the iron fist under the velvet glove. You thought you could vote. You thought you could do this. You thought you could do that. Well, watch this. Nobody, not you liberals and not you, you conservatives, not, none of you have a say. And that's a scary thing. And that's what the news media right now is trying to grapple with. I mean, is it really true that we don't have a say? I mean, is it really beyond the rule of law? We've seen so many coup d'etat things. We've seen, for example, Judge Justice, conservative Justice Roberts 
approve Obamacare as a tax, which is a lie, because it would have to begin in Congress, which it didn't. But he tortured the law to make that work, because he was or obviously ordered to do so. He's a traitor to his country, because Obamacare is not about health care. It's about totalitarianism. It's also 55% of the people's wealth has been taken and will never return in America. So there's already half conquering. With the Obamacare, that, 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 that will survive to take the rest of it, leaving a corporate elite to rule the world, a, a global corporate New World Order network, and, and uh, Europeans and Americans and most of the world will be just you know, subservient, lower-class people to be culled to, to start the uh, eugenics and uh, you know, to, to, to be producing the proper slaves for the, uh, for the elites who will play in their gardens of, you know, their gardens of, uh, of Atlantis and enjoy themselves, uh, but be a much smaller population. And that's the immediate, that's what they think they're going to get. But there's a bigger agenda, which has to do with te high technology and eternal living in man's terms, which is, of course, a joke because this uh, reality we're in right now is, is uh, it's just like an after, I mean, it can be just set aside. Remember, Paul went to the third heaven, which is, a, he went to a higher dimension, okay, heaven meaning up. Right? Heaven meaning higher dimension, higher octaves of existence. And um, no, it's not some sequestered place, you know, suspended in, in the universe somewhere that this old gray guy with a beard is lording it over everybody. That's absolutely, I think those kind of myths were generated to scare children. You know, the, the, it's just nothing like that. You're talking about higher octave, the octaves where the satanic doesn't exist. The robots don't exist, and you can go there right now. If you want to go to where Paul went, you can go there right now. You know, it's a, if you ask the Lord and you forgive everything, meaning let go. Forgiveness really means let go of everything. All the traumas, all the things, all the, the, the witchy, witchy attacks, all the things even that people are doing to you right now, you just let it all go. And, you know, you get into like a meditative state with the Lord, you know, in, in, your, in your quiet place. And um, you, you seek him, you know, and he's not going to deny you. But he would love to have you in the third heaven. Anyway, in that dimension, none of this exists, no, nor did it ever. I don't know how he pulls that off. I don't know how that works, but that's, that's exactly the way it is. When you've been in love, when, when you go up in the agape, this unconditional love that's more powerful than any physical love, I mean, the ultimate love, which, is, which transforms your spirit and your mind and brain and your body and everything, um, you talk to people in that state, or even people who have just fallen in love, and, and it's, all, it's all like in the heart and in the mind, and it's not just a physical thing. They will tell you there's no evil in their lives. There's no perception of Satan suddenly gone. There is nothing like that. They're just in love. Everything's powerful and optimistic. In these higher octaves, uh, they can't imprison you. So if you're there, there is no Satan. There are no fallen angels. There never were. There is no evil. There never was. God is love, whatever. You are light. And... Um, there's nothing like that, and it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a thing you can't really describe because it's so different. You know, no, no words here would, would be able to describe it. Uh, you know, we, we try, but it, it, it just fails, you know, because it's not like a place, like you open a door and there it is. You know, it, it's, be, it's meta place, it's beyond place, it's after place. There's no such thing as place anymore. Like that word would not exist. <laughs> and um, even a little bit higher as you move toward the light or love the, or God as you move into the, 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 the initial heavens and the, the second heaven you still have you know Lucifer there but it's more like you, know, you have your ascended masters so called and all that and then as you go further they, they, those things don't exist and the rub is, the war is, that they want the power of the Almighty in that place they don't exist in because they need to exist in order to exist, if you see what I mean. So they have a struggle to, to live and exist. They consign people to this struggle. 
to this realm. Uh, they, 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 they recruit people and, you know, play games like trying to take all God's people away through propaganda so that, and education or diseducation so that God has no reason to deal with this planet. Therefore, they can put him in a checkmate position and force him to do what they want, which is to the old Enochian issue, which was to re-include them in the whole plan. And that's not going to be happening to re-include them in the whole plan. Because the reason why is because they, you know, there's a, there's a thing about existence. In other words, it's, there are certain things that are just the way they are and always will be, and, and this is one of them. Uh, it's not our purview to deal with it. See, in the place that we actually exist in, you know, some, the myth goes, want it out. And wanted all this. God, obviously, is not a victim here. He wanted all this as well. Because true love and true worship would be, despite all odds, uh, his people love him and know him from the lie. And, and no matter how much diseducation, no matter how much propaganda, no matter how much uh, you try to contaminate the human genome, they still know their father. They still know the Lord. They still know where they belong. And they just can't figure that out at this late stage. They just can't figure that out. So I would say, um, you know, just like my book, Lamb, it's just all, the Lamb is just another true book. It's absolutely spells it out in fictional form what it's really all about. That no matter what they do, um, their pyramids and their obelisks, as they were of old, are in danger of being removed. Meaning that power removed from the earth. That the angels have more power than the fallen angels. And that's, you know, I think proven to be true that um, the, the power the dragon provides to the... Uh-oh, there's a mouse. Where is my cat? Okay, well, I'll deal with that later. I don't want to just... Yeah, usually I kill them, I throw them out for the crows. The crows eat them. This mouse is, now no, the cats were in the, where I'm sitting, right? They were here this morning at the wee hours. But I suppose that's, um, and I'm a big bad predator. Because either me or the cats will kill that mouse. That mouse has got no protection. <laughs> um, you know, and that's, and that's what it's like to try to do this on your own. Um, a lot of people, when they meet the Lord, and they just, they suddenly, their eyes are open. They run to the shelter of a church to put down their ten stakes. And, and the church tells them, it's okay. You can keep operating business as usual at your job and everything else. It's, uh, you know, we're not going to tell you not to make a living or anything like that. So there's that, that uh, corruption. And what ends up happening is, you know, my, my answer is, I don't know, did they tell you that you couldn't make a living if you were with Jesus? Well, that's your understanding. Well, um, you know, that Jesus is a mystery, you know, that, that you know, it's, it's funny how there are people completely sold out to him that continue to survive. So this idea that you can't live without the devil, without making some sort of deal, is false. So I would just urge you to, uh, you know, it's okay though, because in the end, I mean, I'm not, I'm not gonna, I can only say, say it to people that are waking up. I, the people that are meant to, you know, serve the world system and all that, they're, they're there, and I don't even know what they are. I don't even know how it all winds up. I just know that um, where you're heading, people, is uh, outside this prison realm. And they're trying to prevent that. So there's something you've got that's very, very valuable and precious to them. 
And, um, you know, in a sense, that's, you know, how it is on this farm. There's, it's, a, it's a commodity farm. And um, the threat is Jesus Christ. You don't see any other religion, I mean, any other way, any other person, any other form of prayer being made illegal, do you? No. It's Yahweh, Jesus, Yeshua, whatever. That's, that's what's being made illegal, not anything else. Um, uh, celebrations of other religions go on in, in all, all over the country without anybody uh, saying a thing, without uh, the atheist or anybody else objecting. So it's, it's all, those, those atheists, it's all a lie. They're promoting an agenda, all right, but it's, it's, it's not atheism. It's belief that Lucifer is their savior, that they will never admit exists, so hence they have atheism, but that's their true God. That's their way. Atheists are largely Luciferians, um, and, they, and knowingly so. No, no, they're not agnostic. They are conscious Luciferians, conscious Luciferians. They hide it. They take their mask off, and they say atheist, but then back in the woods somewhere, they're, they're suddenly Luciferians, and the masks come off, and they, 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 they do their dance and their rituals, and they're, they're, they're Luciferians. Yeah. And they believe that Lucifer is their savior and that he's co-equal to Jesus and that somehow uh, there's a, a battle that Lucifer will win, give man reason, give man an in intellect, give man technology so that man can reach the stars and not perish. And they're, they're blinded by that. And they're blinded to all the evil that they do because it's a, like the ends justify the means. That's why they can be so mean about it. And they're evil, they're blind to all the evil that goes on in the world, wars, rumors of wars, children starving, the whole bit of human suffering. And they, they just feel that, therefore, we need to double down on Lucifer. I mean, that's, they're, no, they're not going to repent. That's why I don't waste my time with them. I mean, it's a, it's a waste of time. They're doing what they were made to do. And God wanted that contest, apparently between Jesus and Lucifer and, and whatever, and, and, uh, which is no contest because the Lamb is God, amen. So it's, it's, but that's the way they look at it. Um, so they're threatened by praying people. And they're even trying to get it so that if they can see into your house and see you're praying there, they'll find some other thing to get you on. In other words, they don't want you praying privately either in your own home. <laughs> they haven't figured out a way to stop that yet, but they can look in there. You know, they can see you're praying. They say, oh, there's one. Because they're probably praying against Washington, D.C. They're at the end. We've got to stop them from praying. So, I mean, it's gotten, and throughout history, there's been, uh, because there's evidence, obviously, they know that prayer works. And, uh, in the end of the day, even most of them get scared. Not the hardcore guys, like, like you know, your leaders. But a lot of them get scared and get on their knees. And they're like, this is way over my head. Lord, please help me. Please save me. Absolutely. And he will. That just means you were prodigal son or daughter from the very get-go. Hallelujah. You come home and there's a big feast for you. Just like, you know, when people belong to them and they were prodigals and they come home to, to that side, they have a big feast as well. It's just tit for tat all the way down the line. It's really amazing. Um, it's clear to me that the, the, you know when I mentioned Dark Side of the Moon and uh, and and uh, uh, 2001, which were kind of in the same era of each other. You know, uh, it was amazing how nobody really knew uh, the purpose of both of those works along with, you know, the various other kind of cultural things coming out of either record industry or movie industry. You know, the rise of the anti-hero in Hollywood, um, the rise of, uh, you know, kind of like atonal frequencies to produce a certain thing in people, the rise of uh, um, all kinds of things. And, and um, it all happened in that era. Um, the, the, the premise, if you will, that popular culture was putting out was, which they've been putting out the whole time, including now with pop stars like uh, Gaga, Beyonce, and the rest of it, uh, Jay-Z and, and the rest of them who seem to be very popular. But the, the answer in, you know, you know, the same thing is being pushed, i.e., you know, with all the symbolism of the uh, pyramids, the Illuminati, all-seeing eye, 
these are appearing in the music videos constantly. They're promoting, you know, basically the same premise that Dark Side of the Moon made, which is basically um, you better get started because you've lost. You've, um, um, the mouse keeps very bold. He keeps coming out here. Maybe I'll just grab him and throw, by the tail and throw him outside and see if he, you know, if he survives, he gets a pass. Uh, but the premise that one must, you know, feed the dragon to be fed, you know, that, that whole thing uh, that is the premise of, of all of these. That in other words, there's another force, the monolith, and we have to make our peace with that in order to have a life. We have to have reconciliation with that in order to have a life, but no one who's reconciled to that can speak about it because it has to be in darkness and secrecy. And they don't because, they, because supernaturally they would lose their place and their juju and their whatnot. So they don't do it because money's at stake. When money's at stake, people can be very secretive. So they don't say that this is what's going on. It's something that you have to awaken to. So the music and the cryptic lyrics were supposed to awaken you to the mind control so that you would get in line and you would serve the three-piece suit in the boardroom, which, which the rock bands... Which the rock bands... Uh, gosh, which the rock bands were, um, I keep saying, you know, the mouse, and I'm like, am I going to kill her or let my cats get it? I'll bring the cats back out here. I think there were some, the mouse had some babies here. We, yeah, we have mice, and it's less now than we used to, but they're there. And they always end up getting dead. And I always tell them, why don't you live elsewhere. Well, because there's those dishes of cat food on the floor over there. So there you go. And I hate to kill anything. I really do. So the bottom line is uh, ignorance has played a great part in capturing of souls, including propaganda campaigns like, um, you know, music and, and movies uh, to somehow glorify. And then later, with movies like uh, The Game, you know, The Fight Club, various other ones that were dealing with this subject, The Big Empty, the, there's a number of them, uh, anger management even to a certain extent, promoting a certain point of view that is considered by man a tradition, but no one can say anything because nobody wants to lose money, bottom line, and no one wants to get hurt, bottom line, or they don't want to lose money and or get hurt, bottom line. Well, that's one bold mouse. So the push, and they go, well, yeah, that, and all those tones in your music, see, I mean, there's, it's just wild, and, and well, it's like, yeah, and, and it's, 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 uh, it's going to be what it is, and, uh, and I'm just not going to conform to anything. I'm just going to, I got to blow hard, and I'm going to, and I am. And, uh, you know, I just give it to the Lord and say, you know, if it comes out where all the Christians reject it as being of the devil, that's fine with me. You didn't say anything about God in that song. Yeah. No, I didn't. So sue me. See what I mean? It's not about what you think it's about. It's not about this obvious thing. What it's about is... What it's about is basically that the enemy believes, you know, through all the propaganda, they believe they've won. And that there's only just a few of these lambs, these people that just don't get it. You put it in their face, you give them all the evidence, you give them all the propaganda and movies and, and records and different things. You, you give them pop culture, you give them all these popular things, Rolling Stone magazine and all the rest of it, and, the, and all the different publications and all the different news media and the New York Times and Time Magazine and Nat Geo and the Discovery Channel and, and 50,000 different channels and stations and teachers and education and, and, and textbooks. Come on, you're too bold, man. You're going to get yourself killed. You don't fool around with Yahweh. I might as well be Yahweh, you know? This is a rebellious little mouse. He thinks he's one. So he comes out and he, he runs around thinking that I'm, 
I've never seen anything like it before in my life. Okay, well, you, you're going to be taken care of, mouse. No, no. You can't play. You're not a pet. This mouse, he actually thinks he's a pet. I can't believe it. He's acting like a cat or something. He has no fear of me. And he's, yet, he's just like a little baby. He's a little, aw, gosh, I, I'm going to, I can't watch my cats. They've obviously had them in, in their mouth because I can hear them go making that cry in the middle of the night and there's some little scars on the back of this one already. But he's uh, determined. What the heck? He's, he's, he's just not afraid of me. Uh, I gotta feed him to a snake is what I'm gonna do. They need live animals. Anyway, we're about done here. Uh, <clears throat> but, but the point of all the pop culture is like, well, then don't contribute to it. It's like, no, you, got, you have to understand the other side of this. Um, feedback guitars, big drum kits, you know, heavy duty bass that holds down the entire rhythm section. This is all, uh, this is all my roots, you know. And, and so I'm going to speak truth to power. And I speak at it in various ways, but I'm not with it. I'm not propagandizing you to join the, the way that leads to death or, the, or to be, so become some robot slave. I'm not promoting that. But you people know just how difficult it really is you know, this the issue and how nobody's really at peace, i.e. us and them. So you attack who you consider them and then you feel they're attacking you, that is us, and there is never any peace from it. I, let me take it one step further. With the inner conflict that you have that becomes externalized, there is never any peace until you are reconciled or made whole, where the two opposites become one, which occurs in Christ. That's why... He's called the Prince of Peace because that is peace. At the same time, the book of Revelation, Revelation 19, reveals Jesus Christ as the word of God that is a God of war, a double-edged sword that has a vesture dipped in blood and a name that nobody can say, hence the identity of God. Nobody can say God's name. And, and Yahweh is just an approximation. No one can actually say it. So... He's revealed ultimately at the end of the God of War. Then he's revealed as the Alpha and the Omega. In other words, the, the one that bridges time into one, timelessness. The Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last of war and of peace, where all is made in love in one, where the two become one, embodied through Christ as containing all the opposites, and um, finally, finally, uh, the reconciler to God, but God is also within. So the reconciler of that corruption within us is the Lord who is within us. It's the dangest thing. But it's, um, and then heeding his word, of course, leads to not lying under oath, not being a liar out there writing cryptic lyrics and saying all this stuff about um, that's really kind of massaging people to open their eyes and see there's a big bad dragon here that you have to kind of but uh, embrace it and you'll be we'll all be friends and we'll be like pirates and we'll go wreak havoc on the uh, unwashed masses well what happens when all the unwashed masses are in and of themselves if everybody's a pirate then what happens right that's the end of the game so it's a lose-lose situation. I've never seen a mouse so bold and so determined. Uh, it's just amazing. And with that, I bid you shalom, shalom. I'll see you next time.